my name is Bailey Talsma, and I want to welcome you to Emmanuel Church's online worship service. I'm so glad we get to worship God together. Could you take a moment right now and share this video with your friends and family? Thanks for spreading the word. As Christians, we worship God with the giving of our tithes and offerings. This isn't only worship to God, but it helps to bless others. 1 Peter 4, 9 through 10 says, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. You can learn more and give at erc.la forward slash give. Today, we get to partake of the Lord's Supper. Please prepare your hearts and the elements and join us for communion right after the service. Our call to worship comes from Isaiah 25, verse one. Lord, you are our God. We will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things. God, we thank you that we can come and worship you. You're worthy of our praise. You deserve it all. Oh, yeah. Stop the Lord Almighty. 
Ephesians 1:18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Let's sing together. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living That sealed the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Then came the morning That sealed the promise our hope in you this morning, God. We worship you, Lord, for who you are, 
for all that you do, Lord. We ask now that you go before this time, Lord. Speak through your word, God. We love you, Lord. We praise you, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, and welcome to Emmanuel's Online Sermons. I'm Clark Corver. grateful you're here, taking time out of your week uh, to worship with us. Um, like you've heard the last couple of weeks, we're continuing to go through the, the one another's, the love one another, forgive one another, encourage one another. And today, we're going to look at what it means to bear one another's burdens. And so today, you're going to hear me say a line, and I'm going to invite you to repeat it with me. And that is, I am a burden bearer. You and me are created and built to bear one another's burdens. And we can do this because Jesus Christ has perfectly done this for us. And so if I just think back to the last week or so at church, I can think of so many different examples of people bearing one another's burdens. Recently, there was a couple on the brink of divorce, but another couple took them under their wing They're bearing their burden. They're speaking life into them. They're spending time. Recently this week, uh, a young woman attempted to take her life. Uh, Some people from our church, young women, helped her get professional help and are daily walking with her, bearing her burden, speaking life into her. A person from our church recently shared they've had a long battle with pornography. They've been brought into a group of people who are encouraging them, walking with them, holding them accountable. It's bearing one another's burdens. Burden bearing is required when Christians are unable to follow Jesus in an unhindered way. And so just a a quick disclaimer, not all of the hardships in our life are a result of sin. However, today when we look at Galatians 6, uh, Paul is trying to get to the point where he's saying there are temptations that we fall into and we might slip up in. And and when it comes to burden bearing, our goal as Christians is to walk with people, to point them to the way of Jesus, and to help them get back up on their feet spiritually. That's what we're going to look at today when it comes to bearing one another's burdens. So if you have your Bible with you, I'm going to encourage you to open up to Galatians 6, verses 1 through 5, and let's look at what Paul has for us here. The scripture begins, and it says this, Brothers and sisters, if someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load." I want to begin by looking just at verse 1. Look at this again with me. It says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin. When Paul writes, if someone's caught in a sin, in the Greek, it's a passive writing. It's a passive language, meaning that something is happening to them. This word can also be translated if someone makes a mistake or if somebody slips. His point here is that life will often throw us obstacles And oftentimes those obstacles make us susceptible to temptation. Now, sin is never justifiable. You and I are never to take on a victim mentality. Woe is me. You know, they made me do it. Life made me do it. Paul is saying there are things in life that we might be susceptible to, tempted towards. And if we fall into sin, we have to help them. So it's not like this is some kind of rebellious, I'm going to stick it to the man, I'm going to get revenge kind of sin. This is, hey, I made a mistake. I slipped up. I didn't want to do this. It happened, right? This is what Paul is getting at here. Recently, I watched a documentary. Help me make sense of this. And the documentary was about one of the more famous athletes, really, in the history of sports. And this individual has recently fallen from glory. Injuries and sexual immorality, things that really derailed the career. In the documentary I watched, I saw from a very little age, this person has been practicing sports, practicing, practicing, practicing. And this person's parent and coach were very immoral. It was very blatant, 
very obvious. And for decades, this athlete was exposed to it. So while, again, this athlete's decisions um, aren't justifiable, you're able to make sense as to how this person got to where they're at. And it's a mistake. It's a slippage. They were caught in a sin, as we read in Galatians 1, verse 2. Uh, Jerry Sitzer, who a lot of this sermon today should be attributed to a chapter of his book, Bearing One Another's Burdens, has a great quote, and this is what he says. He says, Every day a woman discovers that she's pregnant against her wishes or someone else's. Every day a young man finds out he has cancer and must decide whether it's worth to undergo the treatment that may be worse than the disease. Every day a teenage girl is mocked because she has a homely face or stringy hair or fat legs. Every day a baby is born into abject poverty and will have to grow up with none of the privileges most people in America enjoy. Every day a middle-aged woman contemplates suicide because she feels trapped in an abusive marriage or unhappy home. Every one of these people may attend a church just like ours, sit in the pew next to us, sip coffee in the fellowship hall after morning worship, participate in a small group with us. They hide their problems from us and we hide ours from them. So what do we do with this information? What do we do as we look at this scripture if someone's caught in a sin? What do we do with the quote from Jerry Sitzer? How do we act? I want to invite you to be a safe person. Can you be someone that others can confide in? The reality is there are people around you who are terrified to share their struggles. Can you and I be a safe harbor where people can come and be open? And might we step into this message today looking at the scripture and say, I am a burden bearer. If you look at Galatians 1, again, the next part of that verse that we read says, if someone is caught in a sin, you have to restore that person gently. You see, you and I are called to meet people right where they're at. Meet them right where they are, because that's what Jesus did for us. And in it, we address sin. You got to call a spade a spade and put everything on the table. And once we acknowledge what's really going on, that's when we begin to pick up the other person, bear their burden with them, and walk them towards Jesus. I want you to say this with me. Don't be too cool for school. Say, I am a burden bearer, because that's what God calls us to. Look at Galatians 2, or 6, 2. This is what the next verse says. It says, we're to carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Well, what's the law of Christ? What's he, what's he referring to? He's saying, love God and love others. You and I are always invited to receive God's love, to love him back, and then love everybody else around us. Then are we able to step in and help. Now, we're stepping in and helping. We're empowering. We're not enabling. Sometimes that can get a little confusing, a little dicey when it comes to bearing one another's burdens. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So you address the sin. You call a spade a spade. But then the next step to this is you have to address the circumstances surrounding the sin. How can you bear one another's burdens, create a plan, make a goal, and turn your eyes upon Jesus and walk towards Him? Let me give you a couple examples. If someone's experiencing, they're living in a sin of habitually telling lies, they have a narrative in their head that's just untrue. All right, you address the lie, you address the sin, but then you have to address the circumstances and maybe get an accountability partner, possibly get a counselor or a therapist to talk to, start processing the worldview and the way that we look at ourselves, at God, at other people, so that we can right our path. Let's say someone's uh, experiencing a sin. They have too much time on their hands and they find themselves um, getting into trouble. It might be helpful to bear someone's burden and help them find a job. I recently talked to someone who is stealing to survive. I said, let's bear one another's burdens and let's see if we can get you connected to a food bank and get you some food. Let's say someone's dealing with the sin of coping. And they're drinking alcohol. Let's address the sin, but then bear one another's burden and get them connected to an AA group or a Bible study group where they're able to address the issue and be held accountable. You see, there's no better model for this, shocker, than the person of Jesus. When Jesus is going around ministering to people, he's always addressing sin and addressing the heart issue. And then he's often addressing the circumstances around it. Case in point, if you go to Luke 5, there's a really cool story of a man who's lame and his friends are bearing his burden of his inability and they carry him to Jesus. But when they get to Jesus, there are so many people there, they can't get to him. 
So they have to go around, get up on the roof, and drop him down. And I want you to pay attention to what Jesus says to him. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. He's addressing his heart. He's addressing sin. The passage continues to go on. It says, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk. But I want to tell you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. So Jesus first addresses sin in his heart, and then he addresses the circumstances at hand, and he brings healing to this man's life. So I got to tell you, there are people in your life that God has placed within your sphere of influence that you are called to bear their burdens, to walk with them, to spiritually get them back up on their feet and back to the way of Jesus. I want you to say it with me. You ready? I am a burden bearer. This is what we're called to. So I'm going to give you a couple of words of advice as we do this. The first thing is this. Burden bearing is not meant to be done alone. You and I are not meant to take the weight of someone else's problems, all of it at least, upon our shoulders. You know, you might need to have an accountability partner who checks in on a daily basis. I've got an accountability partner. It's fantastic. I recommend it. But then you might have weekly worship or a group you connect with on a weekly basis. If you want to take it a step further, you might actually go see, again, a counselor or a therapist, someone to really process these things on a monthly basis. So you have daily, weekly, monthly. There you have it. The second thing is this, create boundaries. When you're going to be bearing another person's burdens, you're walking with them. You're pointing them to the way of Jesus. But it's going to take time. It's going to take money. And it's going to take, really, your availability. And as Jerry says in his book, every hour spent, every dollar spent is probably going to be well spent pouring into somebody else, but it's also an hour or a dollar that could have been given to another cause. And so you have to pray and say, Holy Spirit, would you help me discern? How am I to create this relationship? What boundaries do I need to put up so I can bear this person's burden, walk with them towards Jesus, get them back up on their feet and on their way, and still protect my family, my church, my life, whatever it is that God is also calling you to. The third thing is this, create goals. What's a short-term goal? What's a long-term goal? Sit with the person you're walking with and say, hey, what do you want out of this? Have them decide. Like I said earlier, this is all about empowering, but not enabling. If you and I are caring more about another person's well-being than themselves, you got to sit down and have an honest conversation and say, I want to bear your burdens, but I need you to put effort in. I need you to try. And we give them some time. We give them some grace. But if there comes a point in time where we want it more than them and there's no effort put involved, that's when you got to go back to those boundaries that you put in place. Take a step back. Continue to pray for that person and pray that they would step into what God has for them. But they need to want it too. If we enable and we don't empower, the second that the person who's bearing burdens takes a step back, maybe they're fatigued, they're worn out, they're tired, everything's going to unravel, everything you've done. So we don't want to enable people and make them dependent upon us as the burden bearers. We want to point them to the way of Jesus. You and I are supposed to be the, the, the barriers on the road, keeping them on the straight and narrow, and the road signs pointing them to Jesus Christ. That's our goal. Now, how might God be inviting you to take a step in today? As we look at Galatians 6, Say, how am I called to bear someone else's burden? Who needs help around me? Now, one of the notice things I, I have is, that, is this. Oftentimes, our past struggles will lead us into corresponding ministries. This is a point Jerry makes in his book again, and I couldn't agree more. I think back to our, our couple's ministry. There's one couple I have in mind. I heard about their marriage 20, 30 years ago. Very dysfunctional, on the brink of divorce. By God's grace, he healed their marriage. They're doing well. And they are one of the finest mentor couples we have at church. Why? Because they've been through it themselves. They've been through the fire. They've been refined. They've made the mistakes. They've encountered God's grace. So now when they're walking with other couples, they can say, we've been there too. But God's been so good. Here's what we learned about ourselves. Here's what we learned about God. Hey, let me invite you to the way of Jesus. 
I find this also many times with people um, coaching others in finances. They've made mistakes, they've messed up, they've lost their money, and they've learned. And now they're doing well and they're teaching other people, telling them, please don't make the same mistake that I made. This example could go on and on and on. One of my favorite passages comes from Ephesians chapter 5. It talks about this. This is what Paul says. He says, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Let me repeat that last part one more time. Everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Clark's translation, the things that once brought us shame and guilt, God uses them as testimonies of grace. So, hey, this is who I used to be. God's healing came into my life. And now I get to talk about how good God's been and who I'm becoming. Again, all because of God's grace. Case in point, the person I was talking about earlier opened up regarding their struggle with pornography. Uh, data shows more people than not struggle with pornography in, in this form of addiction. And many of the folks in this area have a great sense of fear going, I don't want anybody to know, you know what I'm doing because I don't want them to think differently of me. And really, we all have this to some regard, something we've done, something we've said. I don't want to tell other people. They're going to look at me wrong. How could you be a Christian and, and do this or think this or say this? I don't want to tell them. There's fear that's bred there. But when you address it and you take it into the light and you give it to God, you get to experience his healing touch, his grace. And you go from fear to freedom. And for freedom, you start fighting for other people's freedom as well. And you bear their burdens. Say, hey, I've been there. It's not worth it. It's hard. I get it. Let me invite you to the way of Jesus. And you fight for their freedom as well. So I want you to say it with me again, okay? I am a burden bearer. That's what God is inviting us into. Now, before we jump into the rest of the text, I want to look at this. The scripture gives us warnings. Yes, warnings. As we do this, what do we need to know? We'll look back at Galatians 6 verse 1. And the first is this, don't fall into temptation, especially if we step into corresponding ministries that we've had, you know, hurts, habits, and hangups in the past. Look at verse 1. It says, but watch out for yourselves or you also may be tempted, whether it's pornography or it's alcohol or some kind of couples ministry. You got to be mindful of where we've been, what we've gone through, what God's taught us so that we too don't slip up and fall back into old ways of doing things. The second warning is this, check your heart and don't be arrogant. I like this in verses three and four. It says, if anyone thinks they are something when they are not, <laughs> they deceive themselves, right? If you're looking back at your past and we have any kind of arrogance of it's because I'm so strong or because I'm so good looking or it's because I'm so smart that I got to where I'm at today, we're completely missing it. It's all God's grace. When you look at the Old Testament and God looks at Israel, he's like, it's not because you're the best looking or the strongest or the brightest. It's actually the opposite. It's because you're the smallest and the weakest that I chose you to be mine. I always laugh when Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. He looks around and he's like, look at yourselves. Not many bright and sharp people here, but God's using you for his glory. <laughs> I imagine if he said that to us today. But that's the truth. We're not to think so much of ourselves and think we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. We fixed ourselves. It's just not true. It's God's grace. The Holy Spirit's empowering of us. Now, the other thing here is when it talks about, you know, if we think we're something or they are not, they'll deceive themselves. We have to remember that you and I aren't the Holy Spirit. That sounds funny when I say it out loud, but you and I, we're not fixing anybody. We're not saving anybody. You know, sometimes I'll see couples at church and the message is, taught, is being given. And they'll you know, elbow each other like, hey, listen to that. You know, that's for you. It usually doesn't go well. <laughs> it's not helpful. We're presenting these people to the Lord saying, I'm going to continually encourage you, give you a fresh word, pray for you, check in. But I'm always redirecting and pointing you to the way of Jesus. And the end goal is this, verse 5, for each one should carry their own load. 
when he talks about load, he's talking about the vision and the calling that God's given you. He's saying, what has God called you to step into, to faithful service for the Lord and for his church and for his kingdom? Each one of us is supposed to spiritually get back up on our feet as we're part of community. People help us bear our burdens. We got to help those around us. And so whether it's youth or it's walking with men or whether it's walking with women, whether it's couples, how we get people back up on their feet, following Jesus and helping other people grow to become the men and women, boy and girl that God created them to be. Now, the only reason that you and I get to do this is because the gospel of Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ bore our burdens perfectly. Think of Matthew 11. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. The greatest load and the greatest burden that you and I have to carry is our sin. And Jesus has perfectly taken that upon himself. That's the good news, that now when we confess our sins and we come to Jesus, he has taken that upon himself, and we get to be free of our selfishness, free of our pride, free of our vanity, free of our anger, free of our jealousy, free of you fill it in. And he gets to invite us into the freedom that is ours in Christ. Free to bear the burdens of other people because of what Christ has done for us. So I want to end our time today celebrating communion with you. This is a very natural transition because when we come to the communion table, we're reminded of what Jesus Christ has done. He bore our burdens on himself. He did what we couldn't do. He took the sins of the world upon himself and perfectly gave himself to the Lord. We are meant to be burden bearers only because of what Jesus Christ has done. Now, for you listening today, if you found yourself maybe contemplating or thinking about a temptation or a sin, going, oh man, I don't know how I'm going to get over this. I don't know, what's tomorrow look like? How am I going to battle this? Can I get over this? Is there hope for a future? The answer is yes. Think of 1 Corinthians 10. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God's faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, again, if you're listening to this today and you find yourself on the other side of that coin going, I am a burden bearer. I need to walk with those around me, encourage them, point them to the way of Jesus. Fall back on those two warnings. One, don't think too much of yourself. It wasn't because we were so good looking or so smart or so funny or so strong that we got to where we were today. It's because God's grace is enough. It's sufficient. He's kind. He's merciful. That second warning too is, hey, don't fall into temptation. If we're ministering to people out of our own brokenness, which is an incredible gift, and I think we should, continue to follow the path that God's laid before you. Protect yourself with those boundaries set in place. Have an accountability partner. Be connected to a group. And at the end of the day, it's all about what Jesus Christ has done for us. Because he willingly took the burden of sin upon himself, the perfect sacrifice that had to be given once and once and for all. Now you and I are going to be forgiven of our, our sins done in the past, the sins that we're in right now, and even the sins that we're going to commit in the future, all upon Jesus and when you and I confess our sins, he who says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. That verse can be taken in many different ways. But in the context that we're talking today, Jesus can take your baggage from you. He takes mine. I confess it and I give it to him. So communion is a reminder that Jesus has perfectly lived out the sermon for us. Now, communion is this great gift for the believer saying, hey, I believe Jesus died. He resurrected. He's coming again. I believe that his body broke, his blood poured out because we couldn't save ourselves and he so graciously and kindly did. So before we come to the communion table, I want to invite you to take a minute to reflect, confess your sins, think about the sermon that was given today and grab your elements. We'll partake in communion in just a second. Thanks for taking a minute to reflect confess your sins, and to lean into Galatians 6, seeing what the Holy Spirit has for us. Now I want to move us to the words of institution as we have prepared our hearts for communion. Please uh, look at the words on the screen and read with me. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take and eat. 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And together, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And together, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. This is Christ's body broken for you. This is Christ's blood that was shed for you. Would you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the ways that you minister to us through your word and uh, through the sacrament of communion. We thank you, Lord, that you perfectly bore uh, the burden of, of the world, the sin of, your, of the world willingly upon your shoulders on the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you now invite us to participate in your mission, in your loving, called to love God and love each other. And one of the many ways we get to do that is to bear one another's burdens. So, Lord, if we are being convicted of sin today, would we be quick to confess and quick to seek, seek help? On the other side of the coin, Lord, if we're going to be those helping those around us, I pray that we would never fall into old temptations. We would never fall into the temptation of pride, but we would walk with one another. We would be the guardrails on the road, keeping each other on the straight and narrow. We'd be the road signs pointing people to the way of Jesus. And you, Lord, would do the saving and the fixing. Give us eyes to see people in situations as you do. We love you, Lord, and we pray in your name. Amen. If you're comfortable, church, would you open up your hands? I'll give you a blessing and a benediction, and then we'll sing the doxology. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship and the powerful support of the Holy Spirit be yours today and all the days to come. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We'd love to know that you are here, so will you please fill out the friendship folder? You can find the link in the video description, or you can also sign in by texting us at text at erc.la. I can't wait to worship with you all next week. Have a wonderful week. Praise God from whom all Blessings flow.